You know what? I'm tired of all the fighter slander. Some of the most fun I've ever had in D&D 5th Edition has been when I've played or ran a game with a fighter in the party. And in that time, I've learned one thing. Don't mess with fighters. So, let's dive into what makes fighters so fun and how you can play one in your next D&D campaign. Before getting into any class mechanics, we have to discuss how to embody a fighter. Now, a fighter doesn't have a built-in narrative attached to the class. While warlocks have their patron relationship and barbarians their inner rage, the fighter is just your archetypical fantasy hero. And I've heard a lot of times newer players look at the fighter and say it's boring because it is versatile. Because it is quote-unquote generic. But this could not be further from the truth. Just because the fighter has a solid foundation that can apply to many characters doesn't mean your fighter is boring. Look, let me just name off some examples of fighters in media. Jon Snow, Inigo Montoya, Hercules, Luke Skywalker, Kratos. These are all great characters. And they are all also fighters. Fighter, more than any class, expects you to come into it with a developed narrative or backstory for your character. Because think about it, the fighter is just a person that can fight, and they fit into any story. Outside of combat, you just need to follow the basic principles of good character building. What does your fighter want? What do they need? What can they never have? What motivates them? What drives them? At their heart, a fighter is just like any other character. A race or a class doesn't make a character interesting. How they are played does. So play interesting fighters. Look beyond the basic stat block of a fighter and think what the stat block represents. And I also have one combat role-playing tip for all of you fighters out there. Go ahead and narrate your attacks during combat. Don't just roll dice. Role-playing in combat is important because that's when a fighter's role-play is at its strongest. Think about it, you're a class built around fighting. At least part of your character is probably going to revolve around how good you are at reducing creatures to zero hit points. So it is especially important for the fighter, above pretty much all classes, to keep their roleplay going in combat. Get into it and describe what you're doing. You can be bombastic and cool with your descriptions, because combat is your time to shine. I've converted many players into fighter fanatics by just tweaking this one thing when they go into combat. When you're able to roleplay being a skilled warrior, fighter just seems to click into place. Describe how you drive your glaive into the heart of a dragon, rather than just saying, I rolled a 19 and then 15 damage. And for the DMs out there, I'd like to throw this out. Let your fighters narrate their misses and their dodges. Firstly, for misses, a player will feel a lot better describing how their badass character fails. It allows them to describe things that actually make sense in their heads for the character. Because their description for how a character fails is always going to feel better for them. And allowing a player to describe how an attack misses them or how they dodge it also encourages role-playing during combat and is another opportunity for them to show their character skill without just telling the other players that their character is a good warrior. Again, we're trying to keep that role-playing going for a fighter in combat. If you take one thing away from this video, I want it to be that. Fighters, you have to keep role-playing in combat. Let's talk ability scores for your fighter. Firstly, you go strength or dex for your number one ability score. One of these two is going to be the driving force of your damage. Either you're going dexterity with ranged and finesse weapons or anything else which requires strength. And then 90% of the time, your second highest ability score is going to be Constitution for health. Especially if you have a frontline fighter, you're gonna want to have enough hit points to stay in the fight. And then usually third off, I actually try to push players towards Wisdom. And this is why. Wisdom saves are some of the most dangerous saves in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. You can fail dexterity saves and just take a bit more damage. You can fail constitution saves and you might get a status effect here or there, mainly some damage. Charisma saves and intelligence saves are so rare that we almost don't worry about them. But wisdom saves? Those things are dangerous. They can completely take your fighter out of the fight or worse, turn you against your party. And also, boosting wisdom is helpful for spotting things and trap finding, and it helps allow you take the lead when going into dangerous situations like dungeons. If your wisdom is trash, you are a liability being sent first into any situation. If your wisdom is just decent, it makes it a lot easier to send you in first. 
which is a good thing because you're probably going to have some of the most health in the entire party and the skills to get out of pretty much any dangerous situation. And in general with ability scores, I wouldn't suggest dumping all the mental scores, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, because it does leave you pretty defenseless to magic in combat, and you're just flat out worse outside of combat. So my suggestion is for your top two ability scores, choose strength or dex, and then constitution for second, and then for your third highest ability score, choose one of those mental stats. I know it might seem appealing to go your three highest with strength, dex, and constitution, Constitution, but I promise you that will be worse for you in the long run. So always just have one decent mental ability score. It will help your fighter tremendously. What race you choose has an incredible impact on the effectiveness of your fighter. And depending on which type of fighter you're playing, that's going to affect what races are kind of best. You have melee fighters, ranged fighters, and hybrids. So I'm going to give you my top three races for each type of fighter. And starting with melee fighters, the Undisputed King is the Variant Human. And this is for the simple fact that you gain access to an extra feat. There are so many incredible feats for melee fighters. Great Weapon Master, Polearm Master, Sentinel, the list goes on and on and on. So being able to take one of those character-defining feats at first level is incredibly powerful. Second up is the new and improved Orc. Now I'll be honest, when we first got the Orc class in D&D 5th edition, it was crap. It was worse than the half Orc by a mile, but then the Orc got buffed. Not only does it have its relentless endurance, but it also has an incredible bonus action called Adrenaline Rush. Essentially, it allows you to take the dash action as a bonus action and gain temporary hit points equal to your proficiency bonus. That is so mind-blowingly strong. And the main problem with melee fighters is sometimes you can't get into melee with the one creature you want to attack. By having multiple bonus action dashes in your back pocket, that becomes far less of a problem for you. And again, I also can't stress how good Relentless Endurance is. Not dropping to zero hit points once per long rest is incredibly powerful. And again, it just helps to keep you in the fight. And the final race we have here rounding out our melee fighters is the Leonin race. The Lion Folk have a lot going for fighters. Firstly, they're giving you an extra proficiency bonus with Athletics, Intimidation, Perception, or Survival. And those first three are all incredibly useful for fighters. They have a base walking speed of 35, so again, they can go and get into melee range where normal characters could not. They have Dark Vision, always incredibly useful. They have improved Unarmed Strikes. And they have something called Daunting Roar, which is a bonus action and essentially allows you to inflict the Frightened Condition uh, with creatures of your choice within 10 feet of you. Again, just another race that has a really useful bonus action. And you regain this one on a short rest. So while you're not gaining a feat like in Varian Human, and you don't have the two extremely powerful abilities that you have with the Orc, the Lean-In has a lot more abilities that generally round out your character. I look at it as the higher floor, lower ceiling race option. But we've talked about melee fighters for long enough, let's move on to the ranged fighters. And first up, let's talk about the Wood Elf. Why is this race so good? Well, there's a multitude of reasons. Firstly, they have an increased walking speed. And this isn't important to get into melee range, this is important to get out of melee range. With base 35 movement speed, you can always outrun a regular creature with only 30 movement speed. It's really tough to be a ranged fighter if you're not at range. Who would have thought? And secondly, you get access to Mask of the Wild, which allows you to hide in only lightly obscured areas. Being a dex-based fighter means that you're probably going to have a pretty high stealth modifier. And if there's no rogue in the party, you might have the highest stealth modifier. You could be tapped often to go on stealth missions, and with Mask of the Wild, that might be a lot easier for you. And finally, you just get a boost to your wisdom score. And next up, let's talk about the Yuan T. These poison-loving snake people make great ranged fighters for one reason and one reason only. They have advantage on saving throws against magic. Well, spells, but you know, magic. Because when you are at ranged, there are only two ways of doing damage to you. Non-magical projectiles and magic. For non-magical projectiles, you can get behind cover or just go prone to give who's ever attacking you disadvantage on those attacks. So then that leaves magic. 
and magic is really the bane of a ranged fighter, AoE spells in particular. So having advantage on saving throws against spells gives you a huge leg up. You've essentially nerfed the main threat against you. And that's not to mention that the yuan -Ti also get three spells to work with. Poison Spray, Animal Friendship, and Suggestion. Plus Dark Vision. Honestly, if you want to be a ranged fighter, what's not to like? And last, but certainly not least, the Tabaxi. Take the emphasis on movement that I highlighted with the Orc and ramp it to 11 with the Tabaxi. You have a walking speed and a climbing speed of 30 feet. You can also use a feature called Feline Agility to double your movement speed until the end of your turn. It's a free action too, which is absolutely wild. It is probably the best escape ability in the game. You also have very good unarmed strikes, dark vision, and proficiency in perception and stealth. Two of the most important skills in 5th edition. The only bad thing about choosing Tabaxi is that you will be called a furry. But if you have thick skin, then go Tabaxi. Because they are tremendous ranged fighters. And next we have to talk about the hybrids. Now what is a hybrid fighter? They are the fighters that are not really melee, and they're not really ranged. They're using maybe both, or they're also incorporating magic into their fighting style. Think the Eldritch Knight, or the Echo Knight. And the first race we have to talk about is the Bugbear. The largest of all the goblinoids, the Bugbear is an incredible mix of both power and agility. They have proficiency in stealth and can squeeze through small holes while also having a surprise attack feature. If they act before another creature in combat, they do an extra 2d6 damage. At least if that creature hasn't taken their turn yet. But also they have a powerful build, which means that they act as a large creature when determining what they can carry, what they can push, drag, or lift. They are also long-limbed, which makes sure that all your melee attacks have an extra 5 feet of range. They are honestly fantastic if you're running a polearm sentinel build. The bugbear just gives an incredible amount of versatility. And so no matter what you're doing with your hybrid fighter, the bugbear is going to do work for you. And next up, we are going to be talking about the Gith Zarai. And let's just cut right to the chase with this specific race. Yes, having resistance to psychic damage and advantage against being charmed and frightened are good. But you're wanting to take the Gith Zarai for their psionics. Because by 5th level, you're getting Mage Hand, Shield, and Detect Thoughts. They're basically just being added to your character sheet for free. If you're rocking with plate armor and a shield, the shield spell is going to drive your AC to incredible heights. Detect Thoughts makes you extremely useful outside of combat. And Mage Hand is a borderline must-have cantrip, so just getting it as a fighter is chef's kiss. Each one of these spells that you gain can be used every single session. And if you're going with an Eldritch Knight that has spell slots, you can cast any one of these spells using your own spell slots. Which means you don't need to take them when you're going Eldritch Knight. And now rounding out the hybrids, we have the Half-Orc. And you guys might be saying, wait, but we just had the Orc and the Melee Fighters. Like, why not just have the Orc again? Great question. Usually hybrid fighters have their movement down. You have ways of getting around the battlefield, so you don't really need a bonus action dash. Instead, we're going after the half-orc savage attacks, which essentially allows you to roll an extra die of damage when you score a critical hit. Half-orcs are just more well-suited to hybrid fighters than to melee fighters. But I will admit, you can interchange them and only have minor drop-offs in overall power. Basically, go with whichever orc you like best. And now I kind of want to sneak in an honorable mention into this category because the Lakatha is actually a really good hybrid fighter. Yeah, the fish. The fish is unironically really busted as a fighter. The fish has natural armor, proficiency in both athletics and perception, advantage on saving throws against being charmed, frightened, paralyzed, poisoned, stunned, or put to sleep. The only drawback with the Lakatha is their limited amphibiousness, meaning that you have to be submerged at least once every four hours to avoid suffocating. But if you're running a campaign on the ocean, I'd honestly recommend the Lakatha. They have no business being as good as they are. And a part of me kind of hates it because they're so stupid looking. They're fish people. Why are their features so good? Again, like, Leviathan's will is stupid good. It doesn't even specify magic. It's just any one of these potential saves. You have advantage in. I don't understand this crazy fucking fish. 
But now I also need to sneak in another ridiculously good race. A race that technically is great with all of these types of fighters, melee, ranged, and hybrids. I just didn't want to put them on every single list. And that is the shifter race. If only people knew the power that the shifter race has. You can get proficiency in acrobatics, athletics, intimidation, or survival. You have dark vision, and then you have access to your shifting ability. Now baseline, you get temporary hit points when you shift, two times your proficiency bonus. So that's nothing to scoff at. And you can use this a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus per long rest. Meaning by around 5th level, you'll never run out of shifts. I have never seen a shifter player need more than 3 shifts during a long rest. And then you also get to select an additional benefit, one of four very good options. The Beast Hide, which gives an additional 1d6 temporary hit points and a plus one to your armor class. Great for any tank or melee fighter. You can also go with the Long Tooth, which means as a bonus action, after you've shifted, you can make an unarmed strike with your fangs. That's just more damage. At first level, on round two of combat, you're already making two attacks around. Or perhaps you want to go with the Swift Stride. And what does a Swift Stride do? Well, it increases your movement speed by 10 feet. And additionally, you can use your reaction when a creature ends its turn within 5 feet of you to run 10 feet away. And this does not provoke attacks of opportunity. Great for any ranged or hybrid fighter. Or maybe you want to go with the Wild Hunt, because while shifted, you have advantage on wisdom checks. So all those perception and insight checks, yeah, you have advantage on them now. And no creature within 30 feet of you can make an attack roll with advantage, unless you're incapacitated. Depending on your DM, this might be the most powerful form of the shifter. And I hope it's clear now for all of you to see the shifter is good for any type of fighter. And I also like the role-playing versatility, because you can technically play an elf shifter. You wouldn't get any of the benefits of being an elf, but if you wanted to dive into a certain race or culture, you could certainly do that. Alright, we can finally start diving into the fighter class features, starting with their fighting style. There are a lot of fighting styles thanks to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, so I'm going to go over them quickly. But right off the bat, if you don't know what to choose, just go for the defense fighting style. A plus one to your AC never hurts and will be useful every single combat. Now the two best fighting styles, all the way up at S tier, might just be the archery and great weapon fighting fighting styles. Archery gives a flat plus 2 to hit, so we can think of that as a plus 10% to hit with a d20 die, which is always important. I mean, in order to do damage, you have to hit. And naturally, boosting your chance to hit will raise your overall damage. And great weapon fighting boosts your overall damage because it allows you to re-roll those low die rolls. And it is particularly effective with great swords and double-bladed scimitars. The more small dice you can roll, the better. Then we have two weapon fighting, which is... Fine. As a fighter, your bonus action is at a premium, and Second Wind is naturally always going to be there, and depending on your race, item, or subclass, you might have a litany of other things you want to do with your bonus action. You want to take a fighting style that you will use every turn. So unless you really think that you are going to be attacking with two weapons every single turn, it's not really a good fighting style. But if you have this dual wielder character in mind, then yeah, take two weapon fighting. Then we come to the worst fighting style in the entire game, protection. It is dog shit, don't take it. Protection is so terrible because it's not even that effective when you use it. Sure, you give an attack disadvantage, but the creature can still hit. Your use of your reaction might not even do anything. And because you used your reaction, now creatures aren't threatened by attacks of opportunity from you. If you really want to have a protector fighter, just take the sentinel feat instead. But there is literally no circumstance when you should take this fighting style. Next we'll move on to blind fighting, which is just okay. Its 10 foot range is too short to be really effective. Maybe if the range was bumped up to 30 feet, then maybe it would be useful on a consistent basis. But otherwise, it's just kind of a mid fighting style. You'll take it for the role playing purposes of it, and that's about it. And now we'll move on to the interception fighting style, which is an improved version of protection but it's still bad. It's not dog shit, but it is still bad. Instead of giving disadvantage on an attack roll, you use interception when an attack hits and you block damage. However, you don't block enough damage with interception for it to be worth it. There are times when you might only be blocking 4 or 5 points of damage for a reaction, and again, there are just better fighting styles here that will do more for you. 
Once again, just take the Sentinel feat. Although if you've already gone Variant Human or have the Sentinel feat and you really just want to have that failsafe measure to protect the squishy members of your party, then yeah, Interception is fine. But next we can move on to Superior Technique. And this is the hardest fighting style to really rank because Sometimes it can be the far and away best fighting style in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. And in other situations, in other campaigns, it can be completely mid. And it all revolves around this question. Do you have a specific build? Do you have a specific Battlemaster fighter maneuver that you want? Will your build not work without a tripping attack? And is it worth only having one use? Because that is the major drawback with superior technique. You only have one use of this fighting style. So some maneuvers just aren't viable, while others like a precision attack, brace, commander strike, these things can be useful even if you only have one use. But I cannot stress enough still how limiting that one use is. Because you can take something like defense or archery that has continued usage. Even still, I mean, the Battlemaster maneuvers are so good that any fighter should heavily consider taking this fighting style. It's not up in the S tier best of the best, but it's something that should be considered, and maybe for your particular fighter, it will be best. Next we have thrown weapon fighting, and to put it very simply, this tries to make the throwing weapon character archetype viable in 5th edition. However, it's not strong enough to make that archetype viable. If you want to throw weapons, play a rogue or a ranger, not really a fighter. And strangely enough, archery is better for thrown weapons because it affects all ranged weapons. And like we said previously, increasing your to hit is naturally a flat boost to your overall damage, and it will impact all your ranged weapons. And then you can augment your thrown weapons with poison or something like that. So overall, I see what the fighting style is trying to do, but it doesn't do enough. It just needs a little bit more. And on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we have the unarmed fighting style. And this makes you better at hand-to-hand -hand combat than a monk. Seriously. It does successfully what thrown weapon fighting was trying to do for the thrown weapon archetype. If you are playing to- if you want to play like a boxer character, you take unarmed fighting. This one fighting style makes an unarmed fighter completely viable, and it is ridiculously good if you choose a race like, say, Lizard Folk, which have an unarmed attack as a bonus action. And you might be saying, well, yes, the monk is doing less damage, but it has more attacks. And I'd say, so what? You are hitting so much harder than the monk, and you have increased hit points and AC, which gives you more sustainability. You are a frontline bruiser. If you wanted to play Mike Tyson in D&D, this is what you would use. You wouldn't play a monk. Or you would literally just dip one level into fighter and then keep going monk. But again, can't stress just how good this unarmed fighting style is. I still don't think it's better than archery or great weapon fighting, but it is right there. And for the right character multi-class build, this can be the linchpin of everything. And finally, let's talk about dueling. Dueling is an interesting fighting style, because it's not actually best for a dueling character. Yes, it gives you plus two to damage with a one-handed weapon when you're wielding nothing else in your offhand, but it's best for a sword and board character. Shield in one hand, sword in the other. Or mace or axe or what have you. And I won't lie, the flat plus two to damage is nice. It helps you sustain in combat. But you have to continually ask yourself, is this the most bang for my buck? If you're solely wanting to focus on damage, then yeah, you can go dueling. But honestly, defense is also looking real nice. And you can probably have a lot more versatility if you go with superior technique. Dueling is the white bread of the fighting styles. It is bland, basic, and overall fine, inoffensive but usually you can find another fighting style that will do more for your character. But whew, that is the fighting styles. Also at first level, you are picking up your second wind. And I have one tip for all you fighters, and that is to use your second wind early. You never know when you'll just need a few extra hit points. So if you're below 90% health, just use it. Don't wait until you're at super low health in order to use your second wind. Because it's the worst feeling in the world when you go unconscious, but you shouldn't have if you just use second wind on your turn. Don't wait for the optimal moment, just use your feature. Now we come to perhaps the most powerful class feature in the entirety of Dungeons & Dragons. Action Surge, giving your character another action, swinging the action economy, which is so important in D&D. This is the linchpin of the fighter. This is like the reason to play a fighter. 
And there are two different strategies for how to use your action surge. I think one is better than the other, but it is kind of up to you and your playstyle to make that choice. The first way to use action surge is to use it turn one no matter what. And that usually means burning it for damage or doing something important to swing the battle. With this philosophy, you are trying to get an early advantage in swing combat. You're trying to make sure your party is a front runner. You are trying to get so big a lead on your enemies that they will never be able to recover. And by that point, you've already kind of won round one. Now, if that doesn't work, then you've still used your action surge, you're still doing good work, but it's not as effective as it could have been. And that leads to the second philosophy, which is to save it for a big play in later rounds. And by saving your action surge, you get to be flexible. You get to pull off maneuvers you usually wouldn't be able to. Also, this allows you to survey the battlefield and get an understanding of who the real biggest threat is. Nothing is better than a tide-altering action surge. And sometimes, if you're just burning this action surge for damage, it is more beneficial later in the combat. Because at that point, maybe you found a monster's weakness. Maybe you've set up a combo with one of your other party members. However, the drawback for this is sometimes you might never even get to use your action surge. And that can happen if you drop to unconsciousness before you've used it. Or maybe you had that golden opportunity turn one of combat, but now the combat has swung, you're losing heavily, and anything you try to do, it's just not enough anymore. The party, and you, have entered a death spiral. However, I personally prefer to save the action surge, but I've seen a lot of really good fighter players use it turn one always, so it's kind of up to you. But as a fighter player, you should probably decide what your philosophy is going to be when using that action surge. It helps with your tactical thinking in combats in general. The fighter subclasses really deserve their whole series of videos, but I'm just going to give you my quick take on them. Because here's the thing, choosing your subclass is the most impactful thing you can do for your fighter. It can completely change how you play the game. And so I'm going to give you my top three most fun fighter subclasses and my three least fun fighter subclasses. And this is based on my personal joy running for these fighter subclasses and playing them, and was it interesting? Did it improve the roleplay? Was combat ever boring or stale? How unique was it? Again, this is my personal ranking, but hopefully it helps. My top three subclasses in no particular order are the Battlemaster, Echo Knight, and Psy Warrior, with an honorable mention to the Cavalier Fighter. The Battlemaster gives who's ever playing it a tactical arsenal unlike anything else found in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. It never feels stale, is always fresh and gives some nice maneuvers for outside of combat play. The Echo Knight, created by Matthew Mercer, also plays extremely differently from any other fighter, and you can set up maneuvers in combat that no other fighter can pull off. Plus, being able to summon your Echoes to scout for you helps the party in general out of combat. And this is not to mention the incredible narrative foundation that this subclass sets up. Next, the Psy Warrior. The Psy Warrior is how you play a Jedi in Dungeons & Dragons. Plain and simple. You boost all your physical attributes, you boost your mental capabilities, you do more damage, it's great. Now, it would have gotten kicked out for the Cavalier, but the Cavalier subclass is very DM dependent. If you don't have a mount that you can ride into battle pretty much every time, the Cavalier is going to suffer. However, it is one of the best tanks in the game. If you want to play a tank character, you either go Cavalier Fighter or Ancestral Guardian Barbarian. But those are my most fun subclasses. What are my least fun subclasses? And the first one is unfortunately the Champion Fighter. The Champion Fighter is as generic and basic as they come. They are what people think of as the boring fighter. And you know what? I'm not even going to try to defend this subclass. When you first look at Champion Fighter, it looks like this is going to be a fighter based around critical hits. Instead, it just becomes this generic slog. You don't get any real interesting abilities until the latest levels. That's why I've actually done away with Champion Fighters in my campaigns. Instead, I rewrote the subclass actually. Now we use something called the Vanquisher, which is based around critical hits. Because that is what I think is the fundamental dream of the champion. Not just fighter, but really dull. And again, this is not to say that you can't play a very interesting champion fighter. But the combat portion of champion fighter is incredibly basic. And if you're trying to emphasize your roleplay in combat, then champion fighter really isn't giving you anything. But next we can move on to my second least fun subclass, the Arcane Archer. And there's a very simple reason why it's not a lot of fun. You don't have enough of your special arrows. 
plain and simple. Especially at lower levels, you run out of your magic arrows incredibly quickly. And if you are trying to play an arcane archer, you want to be firing off your magical arrows, but you don't have enough of them. So I've seen a lot of arcane archer players fire off like one magic arrow in an entire combat. So when you fire one magic arrow with five to six other regular arrows, that's really disappointing. And with a lot of the effects tied to saves, sometimes your arcane arrow won't even do anything. So you just wasted an extremely limited resource, the foundation of your class, and you get nothing for it. In my opinion, that's just really bad design. And finally, my last subclass, and this might be controversial, but the Eldritch Knight. The Eldritch Knight just is a bad gish. It doesn't mix sword and sorcery well. The initial limits on what spell types you can take feels extremely misguided, especially with modern D&D. Plus, the class just does a really bad job integrating sword and sorcery. Its best attempt is simply when you cast a cantrip that you can then use a bonus action to attack. And that is simply not enough. At that point, you should just multi-class. Just go fighter and wizard. Because seriously, you are going to get more out of that multi-class than the Eldritch Knight. You will be a more powerful, well-rounded character by just going two levels in fighter and one level in wizard than going three levels in Eldritch Knight. And the fighter-wizard hybrid will consistently beat the Eldritch Knight at every single level. The Eldritch Knight mechanically is just misguided, and I've always had the most problems with players not having fun with this subclass. And I've literally been told, hey, I love playing fighter, I just want to switch the subclass. Or can I just multi-class into something else? And honestly, I can't blame those players. And this is a PSA to anyone wanting to play Eldritch Knight to know what you're in for. And again, these are just the subclasses that I've had the worst experiences with. Maybe you've played a fantastic Eldritch Knight, and if that's the case, leave that story in the comments. All I can do is go off my own experiences. And let's talk about the last class feature, the extra attack. And straight up, this is when Fighter hits its stride and gets great. At the same level a wizard or sorcerer gets their fireball, a fighter gets their equivalent. Because now, a missed attack isn't the end of your turn. By giving fighters a margin of error, you exponentially increase their power. An extra attack is also useful because it sets up combos. Did you know that the grapple or shove actions count as attacks? Yeah, you can shove an enemy wizard to the ground and then attack them for advantage. And you might think, why would I want to do that? Well, quite simply, it's because all your other melee damage dealing party members have advantage. Or you make a grapple attack to lock down a speedy skirmisher and then attack another creature. Sometimes attacking twice just isn't the best option, and sometimes it absolutely is. But the point I'm making is that the extra attack makes all of these tactical decisions possible, and that is what's important. And I cannot stress enough that you might be thinking it's just one extra attack, but I promise you, this is when a fighter's power level completely jumps to another level. I've got four specific actionable tips for you to improve your fighters in combat. Because when you think tactically, you can get so much out of this class. And the first tip is that you need to be aware of where you are setting the front line. Usually if you are a melee or hybrid fighter, your positioning gives or decreases space on the battlefield. You choose the point where the party is meeting the enemy. If at all possible, stretch the battle away from your backline mages and healers. Don't overextend. Make sure your party mates can still save you, but don't stand right next to the bard or the warlock because you are going to draw the enemies towards your weaker allies because you are the damage sponge and probably the main target for a lot of enemies. Next tip, expect your attack to miss. Most fighters get into trouble when they only think about the best case scenario, but always expect your attack to miss. If you're absolutely screwed if your attack misses, then do something else unless this is a last resort situation. Don't always think about the best case scenario, think about the worst case scenario. Because if you run up to a hobgoblin captain and miss the attack, then you are right in front of the captain and surrounded by five or six goblins. And that's really bad. So always expect your attack to miss and ask yourself, what do I do when my attack misses? 
Third tip, use the ready action to combat flying or skirmishing creatures. Nothing is worse for a fighter than not being able to damage the enemies. Whether that be you're a melee fighter and the enemy is flying above you, or you're fighting some really quick characters that keep on dodging you and getting behind cover. But many fighters forget about the ready action, particularly the grapple ready action. Because when a creature enters your range, you can grab that creature, reduce its speed to zero, and stop it from getting away. Or you could just flat out do damage to it. Either one. And guess what? If you just call that you're readying the attack action, then grapple and shove are technically a part of that, as they can be used in place of attacks. So you can use what is ever best in that moment. So seriously, fighters, stop forgetting about your ready action. Sometimes it's the best action you can take. And last tip. Attack the big enemy first. You don't do crowd control as a fighter. That is the role of a mage. Mages have the tools to take down a lot of enemies really quickly. But you as a fighter have an even better tool. You can go toe to toe with the villain's biggest and best minion. So heck, don't worry about the small fries. You don't have enough attacks to deal with a bunch of small minions anyway. Go and kill the biggest enemy that's there. Now this comes with the caveat to not run into a swarm of smaller enemies. Because then, your crowd controllers can't drop AoEs to help clear out the small enemies. Sometimes you have to wait, or take the ready action. But your main priority should not be the small enemies. They should be the biggest, most dangerous things out there. Because yes, while your mages have magical powers, a light breeze can knock them over. You're a fighter. You have high AC, high hit points, and a martial weapon. And you have the courage to stand up against any enemy that your party might face. So go ahead and go after the biggest enemies that are there. Hey everyone, before continuing with the video, I just want to give a shout out to the channel's affiliate and sponsor, Only Crits. Only Crits is an online store that specializes in dice sales and 5e adventure modules. They also carry in stock dice trays and other assorted D&D accessories. I personally love their Spell Scroll dice trays and their duck dice. I mean, look guys, they're ducks in dice. If that's not gonna sell you, I don't know what is. They also have other little small friends, like chickens or pandas. If you're looking for a fun one-shot, I'd recommend The Emperor's End, or if you're looking for a full adventure, I'd recommend The Mountain. Mountain Killer. It's a short adventure only running from levels 4 to 6, but it packs a lot of epic adventure and mystery in those short three levels. And it's set up so that you can drag and drop this plot into your homebrew adventures really easily. I've got an affiliate link in the description below, and if you enter the code DUNGEON, you will get a discount on your order. If you want awesome dice, accessories, or adventure modules, check out my friends at OnlyCrits. And now, back to the video. And at this point, I think we need to address the elephant in the room, the debate between marshals and mages. Now, a lot of players say that marshals are incredibly underpowered compared to mages. I don't think that's true in the slightest. I think a lot of that comes from white room theory crafting and not actual tabletop play. Because yes, a 20th level mage is an incredibly powerful force, but so is a 20th level fighter. Because yes, a 20th level mage has powerful spells. And in combat, a 20th level mage probably beats a fighter. If they go first in initiative, that is. And only if they have access to spells like Banishment or Force Cage. Because mages are like Batman, while fighters are like Superman. If a mage has time to prep, then yes, they will win. But if a fighter gets their hands on you, or gets their weapons dug into you, you have already lost. A 20th level action surging fighter with legendary weapons gets 8 attacks, and they can easily be doing 20 damage per attack. Add in a crit just to be nice, and that mage is easily completely dead. They're not even making death saves. And at low levels, fighters more than hold their own. With more hit points, a higher AC, action surge, second wind, and powerful subclasses, I'd argue that marshals are more powerful from levels 1 to 5. Now, starting at level 5, when mages really get access to some crazy spells, then it begins to turn. I think from level 6 to 10 that mages probably have the edge, and that is solely off of the gap between 2nd level spells and 3rd level spells in 5th edition D&D, because there is an incredible jump in power. But still, the marshals still have their place in a party, and when doing that job, they are the most effective. The fighter is not being overshadowed by the mage. That's only if you're looking at the mage maybe in terms of crowd control. 
but crowd control is the mage's function. Like I said, the fighter is going up against one particular enemy and soaking up that damage. And because the fighter gets access to more ability score improvements, meaning more feats, probably more useful magic items, they're doing just fine. At least in pretty much every game I've ever played. Can mages do some incredible things? Absolutely. Does that mean that they are light years ahead of marshals? Absolutely not. However, I understand that for some players and DMs, the fighter still might seem underwhelming, might not seem interesting enough for you. And you know what? That is okay. Because I have three small ways to buff fighters so that they are 100% in line with mages in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. The first and easiest buff in 5th edition is to say that the fighters get one free feat per ability score improvement, meaning they take their ability score improvement and get a free feat. They can't get two feats during an ability score improvement. Now with this you are unlocking more powerful feats that the fighter can take. So by 8th level, at the very least, a fighter has three feats. Any character with three feats and three ability score improvements is going to be incredibly powerful. And yeah, at that point, their character sheet is going to be the D&D equivalent of a fucking sports car. This is a simple and easy way to drastically increase the power level of the fighter or really any martial character. Next though, I would like to propose a fighter buff for all of those tacticians out there. And this might seem a little bit crazy, but please, just go with me on this. The fighter needs to have two subclasses, the subclass that they choose and the battle master. Now you might limit the superiority dice or might decrement it, so maybe instead of using a d8, you're using like a d4. But whatever the case, giving the fighter the battle master maneuvers not only makes combat more interesting, but it increases their power exponentially. And really, the only thing that you're getting at higher levels for the battle master is more superiority dice. And if you don't want to give the full subclass, again, you just give the maneuvers. But I promise you, a 5th level Echo Knight Battle Master Fighter is more than a match for any wizard. And this is a trick taken directly from D&D 4th Edition, when every class had powers and they were pretty much all balanced. But we don't really want balance, do we? We want to fulfill the idea of the character in our minds. The mage wants to drop fireballs, and the fighter wants to be the best at fighting. Well, if you give all fighters the Battle Master maneuvers, then all fighters are going to become the best at fighting at least fighting without magic. But if you didn't like these ideas so far, I have one final suggestion for you. At 5th level, the fighter should begin to develop superhuman strength. I'm talking Herculean levels of strength. Because while a mage might be able to cast Knock to open a safe vault, wouldn't it be cool if your fighter could just rip it off its hinges? So far, I've done this twice for fighters, and it has been very fun and effective. Essentially, I just took their carry lift drag strength and I multiplied it by 10. Whatever they could normally do, multiply it by 10. And at that point, a fighter could lift a few tons. And the math is super simple. So, the amount that you can lift in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition is your strength score multiplied by 30. So let's say I had a fighter with a strength score of 10. I would multiply that by 30 and he could lift 300 pounds. But if we are making them superhuman, we multiply that 300 by 10. So they are then lifting 3,000 pounds. And if you have a race like the Goliath or a Leonid with a powerful build, that doubles the amount you can lift, carry, and drag. So a Goliath fighter with 10 strength could lift 6,000 pounds. That's 3 tons. And you can do a lot with a character like that. Everything else stays the same about them, but they can just lift and carry a lot. If you want to throw in other combat bonuses, go ahead. But really, this is just designed to give fighters more problem-solving abilities outside of combat. What is a fighter? To put it simply, a fighter is an archetypical fantasy hero. They are masterful warriors and are incredible blank canvases in which to paint the story of your character. A fighter is as bland or as interesting as you make them, and they keep pace with just about any mage. They occupy a different role, but that's okay, since I think that there is only one class that really stands head and shoulders above a fighter. And if you want to learn more about that class, I would suggest checking out this video right here and thank you for entering the dungeon.